Good morning, church. Man, I just don't think you know how excited I am that you're here today, man. Thank you so much for choosing to be here. We're going to have a great day in the house today. I want to welcome all those that are joining us online. Welcome, you guys. Um, I love Sundays where we are welcoming in new members. Such an exciting time in the church. And I just want to give a little shout out to something that you already saw on the happenings is Next Steps. Next month, we're having Next Steps in the month of May. And man, if you have never been at a Next Steps class, I want to encourage you to sign up and be there. It's just a great time to know a little more about Cornerstone Chapel, help us to get to know you more. And so I encourage you to do that. Well, hey, let's grab our message outline right now on the back of our bulletins. Grab your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, some of you might be saying, where in the world is 1 Kings? You know, well, it's in the Old Testament, a few books in. You'll start to see some books with ones and twos in front of it, okay? 1st, 2nd Samuel, and right after that is 1st Kings. So 1st Kings 19, or you can pull everything up on the YouVersion Bible app on your smartphone or device while you're getting that all pulled up. Hey, man, I want to invite you back to church this weekend. The weekend starts off on a Friday, actually, where we're going to have our Good Friday candlelit communion service to come together as a church and recognize what Jesus has done for us. We're going to have an hour service, seven to eight, where we have worship. Our Cornerstone Bible School students are going to be bringing the word that night, and then we're going to just end with communion. It's going to be a great time. I want to encourage you to be here but maybe come in your small groups. Maybe small groups could go out afterwards for coffee and just continue to reflect on what Jesus has done in our life. And then Sunday, of course, next Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It's going to be a great service, and I know many of you are already planning to be here, but I want to encourage you to bring somebody with you to church next Sunday. Grab one of our invite cards. They look like this. We have four tables out in the foyer and lobby area that you can pick up these cards and use them as invite cards for next Sunday. Hey, last but not least, uh, most of you by now already know about this, but this is the last week I'm going to announce that um, in the months of May and June, Deb and I are going to be taking a sabbatical, and um, I wanted just to uh, steer you to cornerstonechapel.org slash sabbatical if you did not know that or you weren't here the Sunday where we announced it because on this page we have the 12-minute snippet um, where I announce what it is, why we're doing it, and, and what it entails and what we're going to do in that time, what our church is going to be doing. Also, there's a, a letter on there that we sent to the whole church, but I just want everybody to be in the know and know it's going to be a great time for our church. And I just want to say, with that said, um, so I have three more Sundays before that time. Today, next Sunday for Easter, then the Sunday after Easter, I'm going to be kicking off a brand new message series that our team is just going to, you know, lead us through, through that time. And so, man, I just want to just invite everybody back to that day in particular. It's going to be a great day as we kick that sermon series off and uh, just celebrate what God is doing in our church. So let's just pray for the message today. Would you join me? God, thank you so much for an amazing time of worship. Lord, thank you now that we get to just dive into your holy scriptures right now, Lord. And we want to position ourselves, Lord, to get to know you more in this time. Lord, that you would change us. You would give us hope. You would fill our lives. God, you would transform us today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right. Well, hey, we're in week number two of this series called Reply All, where we're trying to answer some really important questions that people are asking. And so uh, next week for Easter, we're going to attempt to answer the question that many are asking, and it's this, how do I make it through some of my worst moments, some of my darkest times. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring the message of the resurrection and wrap it around that whole question and, and answer that. And then today what we're going to do is we're going to answer the question, how can I overcome depression? How can I get through? Is, is there a way 
you know, to overcome depression? And the answer is yes. This is a great word for the church today. And to kick it off, I just want to give you a working definition of what depression is. Depression is a mood disorder characterized by anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure. It's also characterized by extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt, helplessness, and hopelessness. Now, how many of you know with that definition said, we can pretty much agree that many people are struggling with depression. Many of us today are experiencing depression. The thing about depression, it's not one size fits all. Uh, Depression can affect us in a mild way, all the way up to a severe way. And so wherever we fall on that spectrum, we have to understand that depression is affecting many of us, many of our family and friends. In fact, it's one of the top Um, health issues in the world today where they say that about one in nine people are currently on anti-depression medication. One in five people have been on, and anti-depression medication is up about 300%. So with that said, we as the church just can't ignore this. And it's also something that we should not make light of, like saying, well, just get over it, you know, just get over it and be happy. You know, we, we can't ignore it any longer and we can't make light of it. We must address it. And the problem with depression today and trying to overcome it is that, listen to this, the culture that we live in is not helping, okay? It, 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 we, we don't live in a culture today that's conducive to helping somebody that is struggling with depression. Let me show you some facts about the culture that we live in. First and foremost, the culture today has become internalized and very socially isolated. How many of you know back in the day when they used to build houses, they used to build houses with big front porches, right? Now you click a button, drive your car in the garage, click the button again, you shut your garage, you don't hang out on the front porch anymore to, to meet people. You're in the backyard on your decks, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's just how culture is today. How many of you know that you can pretty much buy anything that you need um, without even leaving your house today, right? Now, come on, that's not a bad thing. In fact, I, I like the two-day shipping thing, okay? Um, in fact, nowadays you can uh, get all your groceries done by not even leaving your house. Now, those aren't bad things, but it's the reality of our culture, and it doesn't really help somebody that is struggling with depression. How about this one? Our culture has become very inactive and sleep-deprived. Many reasons, but one of the main reasons is in the last decade or two, um, we've become in front of the screen. Most of us have three to four screens that we're in front of quite often. And again, that's not a bad thing, but it's the reality of our culture today that because we spend so much time in front of our screen, we become more and more inactive and sometimes lose sleep over that. How about this? Even though we've become more inactive for some crazy way, we're more busy and we live at a more frenzied pace. Um, Many of us are just going 100 miles an hour with little margin in our life, and that does not help. Um, when, when dealing with depression. How about this one? Our culture, how many of you know our culture has become very self-centered and negative? Uh, more and more nowadays in our culture. Um, it, it's very easy nowadays to become more, it's all about me. Man, that does not help when dealing with depression. How about this one? Our culture has an inability to process pain in a healthy way. Um, We have a saying around here that pain seeks comfort. Um, Whenever you're experiencing pain, the natural inclination is to try to comfort that pain. Many times when we're experiencing pain in our our heart, in our soul, um, many times we want to comfort that pain. And and unfortunately, sometimes we turn to things that aren't healthy. 
we turn to alcohol, drugs, overspending, wrong relationships, pornography, and, and our culture has that inability to process pain correctly because there is a way that doesn't help when dealing with depression. And lastly, our culture has now become more and more um, look, geared towards peer-to-peer, what we're calling mentoring. Again, another thing that's not bad. We, we, I think it's good that, that we can encourage one another in our peer groups and build one another up. But listen, if that's all we have, that's not helpful to overcoming depression because what we also want to have is the elder pouring into the younger. The, those that have been there, done that, to say, you know what, um, I, I'm a little, little older, a little more mature. I've been around the block a couple times. And man, I just want to help you through this. Um, uh, you know, God's given me a little wisdom on this. And we have to be more and more open to the elder um, pouring into the younger. If you're younger, we need to be open to receiving from the older. And come on, older generation, we need to be more available for the younger generation. Come on. So the culture that we live in does not really help. So where is the help? I mean, I just want to say from the get-go that, that, that depression can be overcome. Come on, amen. Depression is something that can be overcome. Listen to this. God uses the medical profession to overcome depression. God uses the mental health profession to help overcome depression. There, there, there's medication. There are programs. There are counseling. And can I just say all of those are a gift from God. Okay, a gift from God. But God also will use the church to help people overcome depression and, and, and to give a biblical point of view on this, to point people to Jesus because all in all, he, he is the answer. Church, Jesus is our only hope. And how many of you know if the church is going to make a difference, there's one big thing right off the bat that the church has to do a better job with, the church should be leading with in this, and it's this. We have to... Um, understand that there's a stigma centered around mental illness. How many of you know that? There's a stigma, if you will. Let me explain. If somebody comes up to you and, and just shares nonchalantly, like they have a physical illness like the flu, okay, a cold, a flu, and, and how many of you know if someone would say that, you'd think, you, you wouldn't think anything of it. You're like, oh, no big deal. I mean, that, that happens to everybody. But if somebody would come up to you and they would share that they have, they're struggling with a mental illness, all of a sudden, it, it seems like people think differently about that. There, there's this stigma that, that, that we place on that thing. And, and church, I just have to say that has to change. That, that must change. We have to deal with this first and foremost. Here, foremost. Here's why. If we are really a body, soul, and a spirit, we call that being a triune being. We're body, soul, and spirit. That means our bodies are sometimes going to experience an illness. But if we're body, soul, and spirit, that means sometimes our soul can experience an illness. And can I say it's not a sin to experience an illness? It's not a sin to be sick, and we shouldn't allow ourselves to be characterized or identified by an illness that we might be going through, nor should we be identifying other people by what they are going through. And hear, hear this, we the church have to be very careful in this. Listen, that we don't make people feel like there's something wrong with them if they have an illness. Come on. We have to be real careful that that we don't make people feel like there's something wrong with them if they're struggling with any type of an illness. In fact, I like to say this, that we have to let people know that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. Now, um, we don't have to stay there. Come on. That's the great news, is that through Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit and his healing power, there is hope. God can change us. God can heal us. God can set us free and deliver. So listen, we don't have to stay where we're at, but wherever we find ourselves, it's okay not to be okay, but God wants to change our lives. Jesus said himself, it's not the healthy 
who need a doctor. And if, if we have overcome something or we're not dealing with a particular mental issue or issue in our life, you know, really the reality is, is that, mean, that just means we had an appointment with the doctor and God has led us through and brought us through and given us healing in our life. So we have to deal with the stigma. We have to say no more stigma, at least in the church. No more stigma. If, if people think that it's not okay to not be okay, guess what they do? They fake it, they hide it, and the problem doesn't get solved. It only escalates, right? And so we have to be, as the church, we have to be willing to give people some space and grace and walk with people and point them to Jesus Christ. Because if we continue to fake it and think it's something wrong with me, oh my gosh, there's this stigma, it could lead people to have suicidal thoughts. And how many of you know suicide is a growing epidemic in our country, all over the world, where, um, you know, and, and just to let you know, I, I want to put this phone number up on the screen that we really should all know um, that there is a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and it's 1-800-273-TALK. If you would ever need this number 24-7 to talk to somebody, or if you would ever need to point somebody, maybe what someone's going through, you feel it's over your head, or you don't know what to say, you can give them this lifeline number and talk to somebody to get them hope. Because here, here's the truth. Thousands of people are, are, are deciding to end their lives all around the world um, every year. In fact, suicide is one of the top causes of death um, for the younger generation, ages 15 to 24. But it's not just a younger generation thing. I don't know how many have heard about this, but last year there were actually two pastors of, of very significant sized churches on the West Coast that took their life because they were struggling with a mental illness and they lost all hope. And many of you know Pastor Rick Warren, he pastor Saddleback Church in California. Five years ago, his son um, took his life. And so I say that to say that it could affect anybody. Depression can affect everybody and anybody. And it can it affect anyone in the family. And so we need to understand and get these tools that the Bible wants to give us on how we can be set free of depression and how we can know that there's hope through Jesus Christ today. Come on, church, amen? amen. So we want to take the rest of our time today, and we want to go through practically the whole chapter of 1 Kings 19, because there is a wonderful story of hope in, in this chapter today on a guy named Elijah. Many of you have heard of this great man of God, Elijah, who did just some amazing things for God. And in order to fully appreciate, listen to this, chapter 19, you really need to know what was going on in chapter 18. In chapter 18, Elijah probably had the highest high point mountaintop experience in the Lord that he would ever have. What happened in chapter 18 is that there were many people in his days that were, that were worshiping false gods. And God raised up Elijah to be a prophet among the people to spread the hope of God, but many of them were not listening. So God said, Elijah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tell them to prepare a sacrifice, and I want you to prepare a sacrifice. Go get an animal, and you're going to sacrifice an animal on the altar. But here's what you're going to do. Before that sacrifice lights on fire, I want you to dump a bunch of water on it, practically making it naturally impossible to ever light on fire. And then I want you to call on me, and we are going to make this sacrifice. It's going to be consumed with fire. And those guys over there, those false prophets that aren't serving me, they'll try to do the same thing. They can call on their God. So you know what happened? They're calling on their God and nothing. Cricket, cricket, nothing's happening. And then Elijah calls on our God, and whoosh, fire comes down and consumes the sacrifice. He's on this mountaintop. He's like, man, my gosh, God is good. God is moving. And so 
That's what happened in chapter 18, going into 19. Well, there was a king named Ahab and his wife Jezebel. They didn't like very much that their people kind of got embarrassed. And so now they're after Elijah, and that's where we pick it up in chapter 19. Follow with me in verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Now, can you guys read this with me? It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. As we read through the passage of Scripture today, I want to point out four things that Elijah did, listen to this, that didn't help his depression, but he did four things that was kind of like feeding his depression, or he was doing four things that were not good. It was only making his depression get worse. Here's the first one, and it's this. He was being led by his feelings. Notice the scripture said that Elijah became afraid, and what did he do? He ran for his life because he allowed that fear to consume him. He allowed that fear to lead him. He allowed fear to to dictate his decisions. How many of you know that God has given us emotions, and emotions are not a bad thing? But listen to this. Emotions, they are to be felt, but not trusted. That's a very key thing to remember. God gave us emotions to enjoy life, to, to be able to experience life from the soul. But we should never get to a point where we're trusting our emotions. We should feel our emotions, but not trust our emotions. We need to trust God. We need to trust the truth of his word and his promises. And in that brings freedom. That's why if I could just give a little side note and say, if you heard in the Cornerstone Happenings today, in a couple weeks, we're starting our second 10 days of prayer and fasting. Many of you get involved in that when we do it. And I just want to call our entire church. It's a church-wide time of prayer and fasting. One amazing benefit that comes out of that, when you disconnect from certain things of the world to connect more with God, is that God does something in our heart to be less led by our feelings and more led by his Holy Spirit. Come on, amen? And that happens in times of prayer and fasting. Look at this verse in Colossians that says, Doing whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like it, and grabbing whatever attracts your fancy, watch what the Bible calls that. Man, that's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of God. God wants to shape our life that we're led by him and not our feelings. Let's look at the second thing that feeds depression. In verse 3, it says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, look what he did. It says, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So we see the second thing that Elijah did to feed his depression was this, isolation. I mean, he had people in his life. He had people around him. When he was afraid and running for his life, why didn't he stay connected to that friend? But no, he isolated himself. How many of you know isolation does not help depression? And many times, we're struggling with things. We're going through things, and we isolate ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong. I totally understand and encourage that sometimes we just need some alone time. Sometimes we just need to, like, we need some space. I get that, and I encourage that. But when we're dealing with depression, and mild or severe, I mean, we need to make sure that even though if you need some time, you get back connecting with people. And it's so important to have good, positive, life-giving people in our life and our family and our friends. And that's really what one of the huge benefits of being a part of a church family, that you can develop those people in your life that, that, that you don't have to live isolated. I mean, being together with people. And some people might use the excuse, well, I'm not isolated. I, I, you know, I go to church. I have people around me. Sometimes we're in a group of people physically, But that's not even what I'm talking about. 
If you're the only one that knows what you're struggling with, even if you're around people, you're isolating yourself. And God wants you to get to a place where you can have a trusted group in your life that you can be real with them. You can be honest with them. You can share your heart. And, and, and that's why small groups are, are so important, that you're in a group of people that, that aren't going to just judge you and, and point their finger at you, but they're going to listen and love you and say, you know what, I totally understand what you're talking about. And that's why groups are so important. In church, you heard that you know, spring small groups are coming to an end, and we're going to take a little break, and then summer small groups are starting June, July, and August. So we have these weeks that we are ramping up for summer small groups, and I can never encourage you too much to make sure that when summer comes, you're in a group. But guess what? We can't have groups unless we have small group leaders and facilitators. So I know that I know that I know that God is knocking on some of your heart's door to say, would you be a small group leader so we can have enough groups so this church is ministered to and outside these four walls into our community. Come on, amen? It's so important. Look at this verse in Ecclesiastes. It says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Let's look at verse 4 in 1 Kings 19. It says, Elijah came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. Which leads us to the third thing that feeds depression, doesn't help, and it's this, faulty thinking. Write that in your notes, faulty thinking. Now, every single one of these feeds depression, but if I had to rank what was the, what's the top one that really feeds it, I would, I would put my bet on it's this one. This is huge, faulty thinking. It, it, it affects all of us. And let me share, share this verse with you, and then let me explain. In a book called Lamentations, okay, if you don't know what Lamentations is, Lamentations is a book in the Old Testament written by the great prophet Jeremiah. He writes the book of Jeremiah, which is just, you know, just a great book of victory in God. And then the next book is called Lamentations. You know what Lamentations means? It basically means I'm depressed. I'm discouraged. I'm sad. I'm lamenting. And so there's a book in the Bible and I think God allowed this book to be in the Bible to say, there's going to be times when we deal with this stuff. We deal with extreme sadness. And we need to know the answer on how to get through it, that our hope is in God. But look at what Jeremiah said. He goes, I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor's gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. Now watch this. I remember... What's he remembering? The good old days? No, watch. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And watch what happens because he's well remembering them. My soul is downcast within me. Now, what does this word remember mean? Of course, when we go through tough times, we're going to remember it. In fact, sometimes it's good for us to never forget some of the things God has brought us through, amen? But that's not what Jeremiah is saying here. This word remember is not just a casual remembering back of how God brought him through something. This word remember, you know what it means? It's a ruminating type. You know, when a, when a cow chews its cud, just kind of dwelling, it, it, it's a dwelling on negativity, it's, watch this, rehearsing the negative. How many of you know you can think of something negative, but if it's rewinding over and over and over in our mind, how, how many of you know it's going to be hard to live in the joy of the Lord when that's happening, right? And that's what Jeremiah was doing. He was going, I just ruminate, rehearse the negative. That's all I can think of right now, and my soul is downcast. Of course it's downcast when we're doing that, but guess what? There's hope. We don't have to live with faulty thinking. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, listen, God can change the way we think. How many of you know that we don't have control over what happens to us, but we do have control over how we're going to think about it? We do. 
And the Bible says that we don't have to be conformed to the negativity in our life, but we can be transformed and changed. How? Renewing our mind. Change the way we're thinking. Thinking on the goodness of God. Let's look at the fourth thing that feeds depression. In verse 4, Elijah just throws up his hands and say, and you know what? I'm no better than my ancestors. I mean, he just gets to a place that says, and you know what? I'm just no better than my grandpa. I'm no better than my dad. I'm no better. I'm just at the bottom of the barrel. And you know what he was doing? He was doing this. The fourth thing that feeds depression, it's comparison. Comparison. Comparison is something that we oftentimes fall into today. Where we're looking at our life, and there's stuff in our life we don't like, and we're looking at everybody else, and we're looking at everyone else's social media page, and we're like, well, I don't have a house like that, and I don't have a car like that, and I'm not married yet, and I don't have kids yet, and what, I'm just no better than, I'm just, I'm just down here. Listen, that is, gonna, that, that is not going to help depression. You know what we need to do? We need to get to a place to say, I know who I am in Jesus. No, I might not have what they have. I might not be where he is, but praise God, I am who I am in Jesus Christ, and he's got a plan for my life. Come on. Amen. 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 Paul, Paul knew it. Paul said, am I trying to win the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I am trying to still please people, I'm not going to be able to serve Christ very well. And so how do we overcome depression? We have to understand the things that feed it first. There's things that we get caught up with that don't help it. It only feeds the monster and that's being led by our feelings, isolating ourselves, faulty thinking, and comparison. So let's make a choice to say, God, I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to choose the right things because I know you have a plan and you want to free me from depression. So let's take the rest of our time and let's continue to look in this chapter how Elijah had a God moment that set him free from depression. I want to give you four keys now to overcoming depression. We talked about four things that feed it. Let's look at the four keys to overcoming it. Verse 5, follow along with me. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep, and all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And you know what? There's some great things from the medical profession that can help us. There's some great things from the mental health profession that can help us. But the Bible gives us some, just some practical things that God can lead us to that can help us. And the first one is found right here, and it's that God wants us to make healthy choices, church. Make healthy choices. We see that Elijah was in the just in a valley of depression, God showed up as God is showing up in our lives today. And basically, in a nutshell, what God was saying through, that, through the angel was, Elijah, let's start here. Let's start by just making some healthy choices right now. I just want you to rest, and I just want you to get some nourishment. And I think that's a word for some of us today, that God wants us to know some things that we can stop doing that aren't very healthy. We can start doing some things that are healthy to make healthy choices in our life. And there could be a lot of things, and you might be feeling overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, there's so many things I need to do. You know what? Start with one thing. Just take one step and take one step towards making a healthy decision today. Like maybe it's what we're eating, our diet, what we're putting in our body. How about consuming water and getting good sleep, go, going to bed earlier? And, and, and how about exercise and recreation and being outside in the sun and, and detoxing and de-stressing and, and, just, and just getting some rest? Man, those are all good, healthy choices that we can make to help us overcome some of the despair and heaviness and darkness that we might be going through. Look at this verse in Psalm 127. It says, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, but God grants sleep to those he loves. 
God's got good stuff in store for us. Watch this. Sometimes we just need to take that first step to say, okay, I'm going to make a choice to make some better choices in my life, make some healthy choices. And when we do that, God, we partner with God, and that's a key to overcoming depression today. How about the second one? Let's look at verse 7 in 1 Kings 19. It says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now watch how Elijah responds. He, he kind of responds maybe in a way that you might not think he would. He kind of gets on like a, like a rant, if you will. And he says in verse 10, he replied, God, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected you and your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. Watch what he says. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You know what Elijah was doing? He actually got to a place in his life that he stopped denying it, that he was struggling, and he just got honest before God. He got real before God. He got a little raw, if you will, which really leads us to the second key in Scripture that helps us to overcome depression. It's, it's this. We need to learn how to pour our, out our hearts to God. Elijah pour, was pouring out his heart to God. And that was, that was freeing to him. What, what do I mean by this? We have to get to a place where we quit walking around with that mask. And we get to a place where we stop hiding or denying. You know, how you doing? I'm good. And you know, man, man, I'm struggling. And what God wants us to do is God wants us to be honest with him and what we're going through. Watch this. Why? So he can begin this healing process in us. He wants to do something in us. He's not going to force himself in us. We have to get to a place where we surrender. And that place of surrender is just saying, okay, God, you know what? I can't do this anymore without you. I, I do feel alone. I do feel weak. I, I, I feel like I'm struggling. And you know what? I don't want to stay here. I don't want to live this way. I know that you have the answer. I know you can change this. And God... I, 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 okay, I, I give you permission to start working in me. And that's really what Elijah was doing. He, you know, and he was pouring out his heart. And, and guys, we need, to, we need to get to a place where we pour out our hearts to God because God can handle it. Look at Matthew 11. It says, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. You're going to find rest for your souls. Can I tell you what this verse doesn't say? Because sometimes this is how we see God. The verse is not saying, Jesus is not saying, hey, you guys get your stuff together and then you can come, you know, come, come to me. How many of you are glad we don't serve a God like that? Here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, are you struggling? Are you burdened? Are you weary? Are you depressed? What are you waiting for? What's taking you so long? Come to me he says. Oh, but God, I'm not all cleaned up yet. That's okay. Come to me. Come to me. Let me. Doesn't the Bible says, cast all your cares upon Jesus because he what? He cares. And some of you need to hear that today. What's taking you so long? Pour your heart out to him. Come to him. Let him minister to you. Let's look at the third one in verse 11. It says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain. Can you say this part with me? In the presence of the Lord. Remember that. In the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, 
What are you doing here, Elijah? Third key to overcoming depression is experiencing the presence and power of God. Experiencing the presence and power of God. How many of you know that one second in the presence of God can do more than we could ever think? One second. And you know, the, the thing about experiencing the presence of God is we, God is ready to present himself to us. Watch this. We have to make time in room for him. Do you hear that? We have to make time and room for him to present, presence, to present himself to us. You can call it your devotion, your quiet time, your time with God, whatever you call it, but it's carving time out of your day that it's just no multitasking, it's just you and God, just you and God, allowing him to show up in your life to give you a word of encouragement, a word that'll, that'll set you free, right? Look at this verse. Many of you know it, but in Psalms it says, be still, watch this, comma, and know that I am God. You know why I'm emphasizing that comma? Watch this. I believe that there's many times in our life that God wants us to have an experience with him and know him in a greater, deeper way. Watch. But we're never going to know him in a greater, deeper way until we are still before him to allow him to present himself to us, to give us that word that, are, that, that, that will set us free, to give us a word of truth that will set us free. And I think, how do we experience the presence and power of God? I think it's in worship. I think it's in worship as well. I love this verse in Isaiah that says, God wants to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and watch this, the garment of what? Praise for what? For the spirit of heaviness. God wants to make an exchange in our life for the times that we're experiencing heaviness that we praise him in return. Lastly, verse 14, it says, He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, watch this, church, go back the way you came. Now, I have dot, dot, dot here, meaning there were some other things he said, but I just want to get cut to the chase to verse 19. Watch this. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Can you guys read this with me? Come on, last time. Elijah went up to him, and what did he do? Threw his cloak around him. You know the final key that we see in Scripture, how we can overcome depression? Allow God to give me a new focus and direction. Let God give you a new focus and a new direction. Here's Elijah. He was doing something for God. He was doing great things for God. He got to a place where he fell into depression. And God said, you know what, Elijah? Um... You need to make some healthy choices. You need to pour out your heart, heart to me and you need to experience my presence. But y y I want to give you something new. I want, I want to give you something new to focus on. Something new that I want you to do. Something new that I need you to do for me. So wa watch what God does. He brought Elijah to a place that he threw his cloak on Elisha. Meaning, watch this, many times when we're struggling with depression, many times we become so internalized and our eyes are focused so much on what we're going through that we're not seeing all the things around us on how, how our life can make a difference in someone else's life. Amen? And listen, one of the greatest things we can do is let God give you a new focus. There's one thing I will never be able to explain is why we go through the things we go through. But there's one thing I do know. 
that whatever we do go through, God can use what I go through to help somebody else. Now, it might not be immediately. It might take some time for me to get healing. But there's a time when God says, okay, it's time for you to take this thing that knocked you down. And I want, you, I want to stand you back up and I want to point your attention and focus on something good and something better. What the enemy intended for evil, God means it for good. Amen? Amen? Let's pray, church.